This is Other Voices. We're listening to varied views from local people who might otherwise not be heard. I'm Melissa Hale Spencer, editor of the Altamont Enterprise, which focuses on Albany County, New York. I'm talking to Stephen Wickham. Last week, he undertook a spontaneous act of civil disobedience. As chairman of the steering committee for the Gilderland Coalition for Responsible Growth, he got a call Thursday afternoon that Pyramid was clear-cutting trees to make way for a Costco before the project had gone through state-required environmental review. This week, he tells us about what it was like at the moment he made that decision. Hi, I'm Marcello Yaya, and I edit this podcast. We don't normally run ads here, and during this time, businesses are hardly advertising. Um, A lot of things are changing. A lot of things have changed, and they will change. But our focus on quality local reporting isn't changing. Uh, We've been committed for decades to a mission of journalism, a mission about providing a forum for the community. But we are going to be asking people who value what we do to commit to that mission as well. And the simplest way to do that is to subscribe. So if you think it's important, go to altamontenterprise.com slash commit. I'd like to start just by hearing um, in your own voice, told in your own way, how events unfolded on Thursday. At Thursday. So uh, Thursday afternoon, uh, I think it was about 1 o'clock, I got a phone call from one of the other steering committee members uh, for the Gillen Coalition for Responsible Growth, uh, Karen White, who had received a phone call from uh, one of our supporters who had been on the town of Gilderland's website looking for something else and discovered this notice that had been posted Thursday morning by the planning department that the Pyramid Corporation had intended to start clearing trees on the proposed site for the Costco so that they could beat a deadline of April 1st, which is when additional Uh, environmental regulations would go into effect mostly to protect um, the long-eared bats and I I honestly just could not believe this was true Uh, so I I but I I told Karen you know I'll I'll jump in the car and and go down there and see what's going on and sure enough when I got there I was just taken aback by the fact that um, they had already pretty much cleared most of the, the wooded lot that sits uh, on the opposite side of, of Rap Road from the Capital uh, City Diner. Um, and I, I just jumped out of my, I parked my car where I saw a truck parked. Uh, I didn't see any crew at this point in time, but as soon as I got out of my car, I could hear them. Um, and there was actually two crews. There was one working the big wooded lot, and then there was another crew working in the um, the abandoned neighborhood that Crossgates had been buying out over time. And I just followed. I walked down <coughs> Lawton to um, where I could hear the closest crew, and got to the end of Lawton. They were working around one of the abandoned houses uh, at the end of Lawton and um, when they saw me they shut down and I walked on to the lot and they basically told me you know I had to leave and I was trespassing and that they weren't going to stop and so I just spontaneously went and sat down on their machine well, um, I'm stopping you. I'm stopping you right there in the yeah. narrative because this is the sure. point that is really interesting. What I mean, most of us might have gone to investigate, but I don't think most of us would have sat 
on the blade of a big earth moving or tree cutting piece of equipment what what was going through your mind at that moment but at that moment it, what was going through my mind <clears throat> is that this has to stop this this can't be allowed to continue because this isn't even an approved project yet uh, how can it you know it's my understanding and since 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 Thursday we've verified it um, that you know you can't if you're in the middle of seeker process which means you're you're actually looking to see what your environmental impact of a project is going to be you can't possibly be allowed to cut down all the trees um, and you know it just it was just unbearable for me um, to, to, to see and um, you know I, I, I tried to call uh, Peter Barber I only got his voicemail and, and Peter Barber is of course the supervisor of the town of Gilderland just so correct, people know correct yep. yeah yeah, who I've had a lot of correspondence with about this project because I'm the the steering committee uh, chairman for the Gilden Coalition for Responsible Growth. So, so um, we'll go we'll go back and pick up the narrative where you left off. I just sure. wanted to examine that one moment. So there you are sitting on the blade of this piece of equipment, and what what yeah. happened next? Um, the uh, one of the one of the crew members said that he was going to call the police, and I encouraged him to do so. Um, you know, and, yes, because and you managed to take video of this as it was unfolding, and we have some of that posted on our website so people can see. Yeah, it occurred to me I should start videotaping um, things and kind of give a, you know, some, uh, you know, my thoughts at the moment and just kind of what what was transpiring. Um, and he made it. This guy, this guy with a chainsaw, made a phone call, and. You know, we kind of waited and went back and forth, and um, and who the police didn't arrive right away, which surprised me. But the foreman um, for the crew did, and uh, when he he came up, and you know, we're all we're all. What's kind of weird about all this is we're all aware of the coronavirus and trying to maintain our social distance from yeah. one another during right. all this. And um, and the, the, the foreman comes up and he's standing at a distance away from me that I couldn't hear him. And I, I just instinctively got up to, to, so that I could be, um, hear him and have a, more of a conversation with him. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, but that, that gave the opportunity for the other two guys to jump in. You know, what, one of the guys that was running this machine to jump in and start it up and start moving it. So <laughs> I, I kind of regret that I did that because maybe, maybe it could have stopped uh, some of the destruction that happened afterwards. But um, so the guy started, uh, you know, driving the, I, I don't know what the name of the machine is, but it's, it's like this big bulldozer with a, an arm on the front, like a backhoe type thing. And it has this mechanism that can grab a tree with a claw and then with this big blade at the bottom just cut it off um, if you see the videos you can see see this and so he started to move this machine around towards the back of the house where there was a still a large number of trees and I decided that the only thing I could do is is like follow him <laughs> right you know maybe I'd have another opportunity or something and he started to to cut down trees very rapidly and try to drop them in front of me so I couldn't follow. And uh, the other guy with the chainsaw went around in another direction. I, I wasn't really paying attention to where he was. Mm -hmm. I was more intent on where this big machine was. And eventually uh, it got entangled with uh, vines, which apparently happens and they they had to stop the machine and that's when i realized i had an opportunity to go and and be next to it again and uh and leaned up against it so and and that's where we waited for the police to arrive so what I, I, I should mention i should mention that while i was following this machine i tried calling ken kovolchik 
And um, he's the town planner. Town planner. I only got his voicemail as well. And then, um, uh, you know, the, um, the police arrived and if I recall right, I think the, uh, I don't, I don't remember now. <laughs> Actually, I don't remember now if, if the police had arrived before I called Councilwoman Laurel Bull or if it was after they had arrived. But it occurred to me that um, she might actually be able to get to Peter Barber. And she was the person, she was one of the people who helped start the group that I'm now the, the chair of. And so I thought, um, you know, she might be able to contact Peter Barber and, and, and put a stop to this. Um, I didn't reach her either. I just got voicemail and, um, and, and you know, when the police were there, we just had some back and forth. And when they finally got um, uh, tired of, they got tired of me. The, the, I guess they had to wait for the, um, the, the management from Pyramid uh, cross gates to show up mm -hmm. to file, you know, to give a formal complaint, and then they uh, put me in handcuffs and led me out to their squad car. Um, at that point, as I was being put in the car, I noticed that Laurel Bull had actually arrived on the scene, and um, she ended. Uh, she she was looking for me up the road because we were back behind the house in the woods, mm -hmm. um, and so nobody that when when they brought me out. I, that's when I realized that there was more members of our group there, and uh, and Laurel Bull was up the road, actually near my where I'd parked my car, looking for me, and um, and she came back and talked with the police, and then they let me out of the car, and she encouraged me to stand down and uh, you know <laughs> fight this a different way, but. Um, so. so when I talked to Peter Barber on Friday, he had said, I don't disagree with people having passionate views, but they have to exercise those views within the law. And then he mm -hmm. went on referencing the coronavirus and you know, having the police have to come out in the midst of that. Do you have any response to that? Um, well, yes. One, I don't think that this should be a time. I know Peter wants to try to maintain as much business as usual mm -hmm. uh, during the time of the crisis. I don't agree with that. I don't think that this is a time that we can carry on everything business as usual. Obviously, I couldn't reach him uh, to make a complaint. There was nobody at the town hall to report this to. Um, the police themselves refused to reach out to Peter Barber on my behalf. Um, so, you know, this, this is not a time for business as usual. And as, as for um, staying within the law, you know, I, I don't remember exactly what one of the police officers said to me, but I'm, I'm of the opinion that sometimes civil disobedience is what's required to um, make, make things change. Mm -hmm. And in fact, our country is built upon that. And I, I reminded the police officer that, you know, the Boston Tea Party was actually an act of civil disobedience. And basically everything that's happened in our country since then, um, all, all major changes basically have some, some part that uh, has civil disobedience. Well, certainly the civil rights movement did, and certainly Correct. the right, right for women to vote did, and a lot of social change has been pushed by, by that. And, so, and, and a lot of environmental movements have, you know, had an had a element of uh, civil disobedience in them, too. So. so then Jacqueline Coons, the Gilderland's chief building and zoning inspector, um, the next day um, issued a cease and desist. So do you feel that you accomplished anything or most of the trees were yeah, gone? I, <laughs> yeah, it's too little too late. That cease and desist order should have happened um, immediately when they got notified. Uh, what, you know, the town, as I understand it, I haven't had any conversations with Peter or Ken or Jackie Coons, mm -hmm. but um, you know, 
it sounds to me from what I can see uh, available online that you know pyramid notified the planning department that we're going to do this and they didn't they they just posted it to the website and said go ahead they should have stopped them at that point because they were vi they, they're violating the law the seeker laws um, and and either the town planner or or Supervisor Barber don't know this, or or Jackie Coons. I I don't know where this fell through the, you know, fell through. But they should have stopped it then, and certainly when they were made aware of it in the afternoon, they should have uh, issued that cease and desist order. And you know, it, it wasn't, you know, we had people calling uh, uh, attorneys. There's an attorney who um, represents the owner of the mobile station near the hotel mm -hmm. and also um, the Sonoka station by the Burger King who is is uh, does not want to see this Costco go in for his own business interests um, his attorney contacted the town um, uh, save the pine bush um, I believe their attorneys were contacting the town and the tree cutting never stopped until six o'clock, um, which it was probably their usual, you know, stopping time anyway. And that cease and desist order never got issued until, you know, the the, the next day. Yeah. Um, they did. I actually went down the next morning um, to see if they were going to come back, because I knew that no cease and desist order had been issued, um, and. I got there at quarter to seven, and about seven twenty, I think it was. Um, that foreman uh, drove in. I think it was the foreman. Pretty sure it was him. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, he's he was there for about twenty minutes and then left, and and nobody came back. So, I, and I haven't been back to the site since myself. So I'm. I'm I'm assuming nobody's called me to say that they're they're cutting again. So yeah, well, one of the things that interested me, um, they had posted on their website as part of the notice, um, B Lang Associates had um, done an analysis of the trees, and in that analysis, because the whole thing seemed to hang on the timing for the long-eared bat. I spoke uh -huh. to a DEC, you know, the wildlife manager who explained, you know, the idea behind the restriction is between November 1st and March 31st, the bats are in caves hibernating. So you've got to cut down the trees where they might be before that. And uh, it seems like they were hanging the need to do that on that. But in their own analysis from B. Lang Associates, it says, um, there's no confirmed occurrence of northern long-eared bats in summer roosting trees observed in the town of Gilderland. And it also says that the restrictions apply if you're within five miles of a cave, and or a hibernaculum, as they called it in the report, mm -hmm. and this yep. is seven, seven miles. So even the, it seems, it seems on the face of it, like even the reason um, for the, sudden push before March 31st um, from their own analysis might have been flawed. Yeah, but, I, it's definitely very weak. <laughs> um, I'd just like to back up and hear a little about who you are, Steve Wickham. <laughs> um, sure. Starting maybe with your childhood. Tell me a little about how you grew up. Uh, what, you know, what shaped you into this kind of a um, environmentalist who would be persistent in a way that most of us probably wouldn't yeah it's funny you had asked me the other day when we we're when you wanted to write your article for the paper um, something along the same lines about like what is it about you that allow you to, to do this uh, like you did and and at the time I I, I I disavowed the fact that I was uh, really did any kind of civil disobedience in the past uh, uh, other than the fact that I've participated in some peaceful um, demonstrations at the federal building where we were asked to leave and around the uh, the issues of shutting down the wars overseas and um, 
and then after I had thought about it more, I realized, you know, this is really kind of ingrained in me going back to my childhood. Um, in second grade, I had a teacher who insisted that we color everything, and which I, I really had ne never had a desire to, to do much coloring. And you mean like in a coloring book kind of thing? Yeah, like, yeah. Oh yeah. So like okay. most of our assignments, we were always coloring, and and I I, I really didn't like it, and um, and we had to use crayons and not markers, and uh, you know. But the other thing about this particular teacher was that she did not, she had this belief that nobody could ever get a perfect score on their work, like. That, that's just not possible. So even if you did everything right, she would mark something wrong. That, that wasn't. And I wanted to quit school in second grade because this drove me crazy. And I, I, um, I was um, in, you know, insisting that things change. <laughs> you know? um, so. And so what did you do and, and as, I, a second, had, as a I've second a, grader? Uh, how, how did you combat that as a second grader, which I, is a pretty you know, powerless I, I position? Don't, I, do, I don't remember how that totally got resolved. My, my father, this, this happened uh, in Skenevis, and my father was a teacher in the junior high. And I, I don't remember how my parents got that resolved. I did finish school. Um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, uh, Oh, that's but, fascinating. But I had, but I had, I had incidents through um, seventh and eighth grade and, and ninth grade and my senior year where I was um, uh, insisting that, you know, our civil rights be respected or that certain things be allowed to happen. And um, when it, actually when I changed schools in ninth grade my my, uh, my parents had divorced uh, when I was in fifth grade and in ninth grade my mother got remarried and we moved to Sydney um, and when I when in when I was in 11th grade my chemistry teacher uh, informed me because I I I'd, I'd formed quite a bond with my my chemistry teacher um, and during a, during a summer program, he, he told me that when I had moved from Oneana to Sydney, they were notified that I was a troublemaker, and uh -huh. to be on the where, you know the lookout for me. But as he got to know me, as my chemistry teacher got to know me, he says, "I realized what kind of troublemaker you actually were." <laughs> you know, so, and what um, kind was that? What kind was that? Well, well, the kind that would. Um, stand up for, you know, when I when I perceived things being wrong, uh, I would stand up for myself or others um, who I believed were being wronged, and and cause trouble until things changed. So, well, that's a good kind of troublemaker to be. <laughs> so, yeah. um, can you just tell us a little more about? Um, the group, the Gilderland Coalition for Responsible Growth, and what what their goals are, and what your own personal goals are going forward after this standoff. Sure. So, I got to know the Gilderland Coalition for Responsible Growth about a, a year ago. I got to know them really well. I, I was aware of them because um, they formed uh, to resist. A, a lot of the development that was being pushed through like the Hiawatha, the development of the Hiawatha Golf Course and the developments uh, up around the library and uh, just, you know, this this sudden surge of development and it just seemed to be pushing through. And, um, and, and you know, it started with Laura Bull and several other residents of the town and I, I, I ran for county legislature a year ago, and Westmere, um, where Crossgates is, this 
would have been my district had I had I won it. And while I was campaigning, I I heard a lot about um, other developments. I learned that's you know the the Rap Road developments. When I became you know I was aware of it through the paper, but I didn't know the you know all the details until I really met the residents and um, and I. I had, while I was campaigning, I heard, you know, different neighborhoods talking about different things, and I realized, you know, these neighborhoods need to talk to one another. And I started a um, just kind of a discussion group um, for these different neighbors to come together, and uh, which which uh, has persisted. It's it's become uh, what we call the the Rap Road Working Group. But after my failed attempt at, at winning the seat for county legislature, um, several members and and by that time Laurel Bull had resigned from the from being uh, involved with the group, to, so that she could make a run for town board. Um, after after I had um, uh, shut down my own campaign. A number of people from the group and other residents from Westmere asked me to step forward to to um, lead the group, and I decided to do so. Um, so you know, I see the I see the Gildan Coalition for Responsible Growth as um, you know an advocacy group for the residents of the town of Gilderland and trying to um, help different neighborhoods work and support together, you know, because the issues that one neighborhood has with a development are quite often the same issues that another neighborhood had with development. And, you know, nobody's really sure how this whole process works. And, and if we can get neighborhoods supporting other neighborhoods, then I think we have a, a more f um, functional town in term and community to get the kind of town that we want. And so, and, and I would like uh, personally to um, see more environmental aspect to this because I believe that um, a lot of this always involves clear cutting of trees. And in this age of uh, global climate change, we need to be thinking differently than we have in the past. Um, you know, this constant development of removal of trees so we can put in parking lots and and other buildings literally has to stop. You know, we're we're, we're we we are in a severe decline of birds and insects and. Um, other species, we're in the sixth extinction of, of species right now. It makes no sense to me whatsoever to uh, cut down uh, a, a wooded lot so you can put up 700, a, a parking lot for 700 cars, when literally across the road you've got parking lots that, that are empty most of the year. You know, you could put a parking garage up in an existing parking lot, if you need more capacity, there's no reason to actually cut down any trees um, uh, most of the time. And you know, uh, the the th there's a book that I read by Tom Hartman called "The Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight," which I highly recommend. Um, and in there, I learned that um, you know the average large tree, the, the leaf surface produces about, um, has the evaporative uh, uh, surface of a 40 acre lake and absorbs 48 pounds of CO2 a year. So, so every time you remove a large tree, think of it as removing a 40 acre lake. So what is the last hour of ancient sunlight? What is ancient sunlight? Ancient what sunlight is oil. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, so I see. So, all right. So, so all our, our uh, the oil that we have been burning over the last hundred years was accumulated stored energy of sunlight in the form of you know carbon deposits. Of course, in the yes. ground, and we literally we have burned through about a trillion years of oil in a hundred years. We have we've taken all of that energy and put it back up into the all that carbon and put it back up into the atmosphere in a hundred years. Scary stuff. So bringing yeah, it back yeah. down, bringing the conversation back down to the very local in particular, what sure. what do you see happening? now with the Pyramid Costco project. Um, talking to Peter Barber, he said the town is making every effort by not just following what the governor has directed for open meetings during the time of coronavirus, which is contemporaneous um, filming of meetings, but the town of Gilderland is also setting up a system where residents will be able to phone in during the meetings in order to uh, participate. Um, do you see any hope in that kind of a system, or what do you think should well, happen go going forward with the the hearing that had to be canceled for the? Um, it it, re it remains to be seen how that system works. What, mm -hmm. what having having run conference calls myself. I'm concerned about a couple of things um, with with the system in terms of transparency because um, some conference call systems allow you to like press a button on your phone to to virtually raise your hand and you mm -hmm. go into a queue and the moderator can basically choose who they want to speak and unmute them and let that person who's raised their hand talk. But the, the, the general audience who's listening has no idea whose hand is raised, right? right. Um, so, so if you were in a public meeting at the town hall, you would at least see, oh, there's a hundred people who have lined up to speak tonight, right? We won't know that, mm -hmm. most likely, <laughs> right? Um, and we won't know who's being pick to talk and who won't be. So, so this is a way to continue to have um, discussions. I mm -hmm. personally don't think that in this time of um, literally life and death crisis that you should be adding the extra stress to people of the town to uh, have to think about major changes that are going to happen in their town. You know, you, if, if regular run-of-the-mill decisions, I think, could probably be handled quite quite well with a with a telephonic system, but um, but these big projects, big decisions, I I see nothing in the governor's mandate that says that you have to do do that. They're just saying you can do it, mm -hmm. and and so. Uh, Supervisor Barber could reduce a lot of stress on people if he would just say, okay, anything that's you know, a, a major project, we're just going to wait until we have, we can do business as usual because we can't do it now. We can't, we can't really be doing business as usual in a time of crisis by definition. I hear you. So our time has gone so fast. Do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to leave people with? Um, yeah, I, I hope that people will, um, you know, not only for the the Rap Road um, pyramid development, the Costco and and all of that, but other developments as well, whether they're in their own neighborhoods or other other neighborhoods, will, you know be more active, be more um, vocal about what they want. Um, you know, I know I know that there's a lot of people who want a Costco to come. I, I'm not opposed to having a Costco. I used to shop at Costco when I lived in El Cerrito, California. Uh, it, it's a very, it's, it's generally good store. It doesn't have to go where they're putting it. Um, 
and you know if people are are um, if, if people want to support our fight for it they can go to the uh, rap road gofundme.org page and also they can find out more information on our Gilderland Coalition for Responsible Growth website which is gilderlandcrg.com Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you.